Well, all right, guys, it's time for our Revelation study again. This time we're going to be in chapter 20, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6. So let's go ahead and read that. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Aren't you tired of the sin of this world? The injustice, the brutality, the scams, the stealing, everybody that comes to your front door, are they legit or? Every email, don't click that link, it's probably malware, ransomware, or a Trojan horse. We live with the fear of our identity being stolen. Do I need LifeLock? Where I guess they can lock my life down? And how much does that cost? That's the reality of the world we live in, but fortunately that isn't a permanent state. Soon, there is coming a time, the millennial kingdom, that will be characterized by righteousness, where there will be no more hackers or scammers, nobody that takes advantage of other people. It will be a time of peace and righteousness at every level. It will be a time of great joy, a time of health, where people will live for hundreds of years again, like in the Old Testament, a time where the environment will be restored to the beauty and purity of Eden. Why? Because it's a time where Jesus is ruling the world. Right now, the majority of our leaders are wicked, controlled by the flesh. So we experience what Proverbs spoke of, Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. Now here it is, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. But in this kingdom that's coming soon, Satan and wickedness will be put down, and Jesus will rule in a loving, gentle way as the Lamb of God, but he will also rule as the Lion of Judah, and sin and rebellion will be immediately dealt with and put down. Now let's look at a few of the details we know about this time period, this thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. During this time, Israel will be the superpower of the world. The capital of Christ's kingdom will be set up on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And Isaiah tells us all the nations will go there to learn from him. They will sit at his feet. So this is a time when the citizens of earth will acknowledge and submit to Christ's lordship. So, under the rule of Christ, the millennium will be a time of holiness and purity. The animal kingdom will also be affected, how they relate to each other and to humans. Look at Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 9. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We also know during the millennium, the saints, that's us, we're going to reign with Christ. Now, Charles Swindoll says this about this time. The good news is that the book of Revelation promises a golden age in which all weapons of warfare will be fashioned into implements of peace. Prosperity will be shared. Peace will be the banner of all people. The light of justice will illumine every corner of the world. This condition will not be achieved through educational funding, political change, social programs, cultural awakening, or even religious revival. As promising as some of these things may be in the short term, fallen humanity ultimately foils all efforts at self-reformation. Praying for world peace sounds noble and pious, but such prayers are futile. 
True global transformation will occur only when Satan and his minions are ousted, allowing Jesus Christ and his glorified saints to rule over the earth. Theologians call this period of Christ's perfect rule the Millennial Kingdom or the Thousand-Year Reign. So we're going to pick up the story in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, but let's set the scene first. What has happened right before this? At the end of chapter 19, Jesus has defeated the Antichrist and the false prophet. They have been cast into the lake of fire, and all of the armies fighting with them were defeated and cast into Gehenna or Hades. Gehenna is the Greek, Hades is the Hebrew. It's that holding cell where they're waiting for the great white throne judgment. So the rebellion on earth has been put down, but there is one more individual that must be taken care of. Before Christ's kingdom can be established, he must get rid of the one who wants to destroy it. And so that's our next point, the removal of Satan. Look at Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So, here we see the defeat of Satan, and I find it very interesting. He's not bound by the Lord, nor a host of angels, not even by Michael the archangel. He is bound by a single unnamed angel. I love what Leon Morris said. He said, the final importance of Satan is perhaps indicated in the fact that it is not the Father who deals with him, nor the Christ, but only an unnamed angel. Now, I think many imagine some huge cosmic tug of war is happening in the heavens between God and Satan. They're standing toe to toe and they're battling it out. And many believe the outcome of this battle isn't guaranteed. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Satan is not a counterpart of God. Michael the archangel would be his counterpart. But Satan is a created being and therefore is no challenge to God whatsoever. So this anonymous angel is able to seize him, chain him, and cast him into the bottomless pit where he will remain for a thousand years. But before that happens, he's still on earth, and John gives us four titles that show the devil's character while he's on earth. So four titles of Satan, dragon, ancient serpent, devil, and Satan. The dragon. We see this 12 times in Revelation, and it emphasizes his ferocity and cruelty. Then the ancient serpent. This harkens back to the Garden of Eden, and it speaks of the devil's seductive powers where he is able to tempt man to rebel against their creator. Then the next one is the devil. That means slander or malicious gossip. It refers to his relentless accusing of the brethren. He accuses us to God. He accuses us to ourselves. That's that condemning conscience. And he accuses God to us. Remember in the garden where he said to Eve, God is a liar? He really didn't mean what he said. Then the last one is Satan. That means adversary. He opposes God, Christ, and all the believers. Then it says he'll be thrown into the bottomless pit or the abyss. This place where Satan will be chained is where the worst of demons are presently incarcerated. It is a place so horrifying the demons beg Jesus not to send them there in Matthew 8. Well, next, let's look at the length of the devil's incarceration a bit deeper. I think this is important because of the different schools of thought out there. Look at Revelation 20, verse 2 and 3, and he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Well, that sounds pretty clear, doesn't it? He was seized, he was chained, and he was cast into a pit that was shut and sealed. Why? So that he cannot deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were over. Now, let's deal with what I believe are some misunderstandings here. Typically, the thinking of my amillennial and postmillennial friends and brothers, and they are friends and brothers, What we believe about the end times isn't salvific. In other words, it's not what saves us. 
faith in Christ does so we can disagree and still love each other and enjoy fellowship if we disagree on these kind of things. We're still saved. We're still loved by God. We're still his children. We're still brothers and sisters. But there are those who believe that the 1,000 years are symbolic and not literal. Now, I believe unless there is a clear reason to say 1,000 isn't literal, then we should believe it is. Why wouldn't we? And if we're not going to take this literally, what do we do with all the other numbers in Revelation, such as the 7,000 who died in the earthquake in Revelation 11, or the 12,000 from the Jewish tribes, or the 144,000 Jews in Revelation 7? Are they symbolic also? Then there's the five months in Revelation 9 where the scorpion-like creatures sting people, or the 42 months in Revelation 11 where the Gentiles trample Jerusalem, plus the 1260 days the two witnesses will prophesy for. And so the point is, if the 1,000 years here isn't literal, when all the other amounts of time are? I mean, why would that be? Or are those other times symbolic too? And if they are, why are they? Plus, I think there's a real problem with being consistent with their hermeneutics. Now, hermeneutics is the science of interpreting the Bible. It's the methods that are used. And in all of the non-prophetic passages, they take a literal approach using a historical, contextual hermeneutic, which is the correct way to study the Bible. But for some reason, when it comes to the prophetic passages, that is thrown out the window. It's no longer literal. It's all allegories and types. And I just don't understand why the change. Why not just read what it says? God used the word kilioi six times in this passage, and that word means 1,000. He wasn't being mystical. He wasn't playing games. He was extremely clear. And I have one more problem with their interpretation here. There are those who believe we're in the millennium right now and Satan is already bound. And here we go, messing with the language again. Even though it says Satan is literally bound, I guess he really isn't. That's figurative too. The thinking goes like this. At the cross, Jesus weakened him, so he is hindered from deceiving the world. And that is why unbelievers are able to believe the gospel and be saved, but he's not incarcerated in an actual place for a thousand years. But isn't that what it says? That he is bound and cast into the bottomless pit where his activity ceases? He's not just hindered, he's put out of business by God. And isn't that what you believe if you are handed a Bible and told to figure it out? I mean, without a teacher telling you what it says, it doesn't really say? I mean, it means something else? So, I think this is pretty clear. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. He will be incarcerated and incapacitated, and he will be put out of business so that he cannot deceive the nations. Again, Revelation 20, verse 3. And threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. And for those who think he's bound right now, you know what? It doesn't seem like he's bound now. And I don't think Peter thought he was bound. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So he's not bound. He's prowling. He's roaming. He's roaring. And he's devouring. But fortunately, we see here, one day he will be bound. Now we come to a kind of a strange one, Satan's temporal release. Look at verse 3, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Now, people have been trying to figure out what that means forever. It's one of those problematic scriptures in the Bible that's difficult to get our head around, isn't it? I mean, why? God, you've got him. He's in chains. Don't let him go now. You know he's just going to be a pain in the neck and cause all kinds of problems. So why does God do this? Here it is. Ready? I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, that's the depth you watch these videos for right there, isn't it? You're welcome. Now, some have suggested, and we'll look at this a little bit deeper next week, some have suggested it's to show how fair God's judgment is and how sinful man is. Man lives with him for a thousand years, enjoying his blessings, but he still rebels. 
it shows that God's judgment against man is fair because man is so sinful and so rebellious. And we'll look at that in a little more detail next week. I mean, the only thing I know for sure is this, it's that God knows and he will always do what is right and perfect. So I can rest in that. And I know we're going to be there. So one day we'll find out exactly what God was thinking here. We'll watch that pit open, and we will watch the devil come flying out. Then we'll watch what God does. And you know what? We'll think, oh, I get it now. That is brilliant, God. Yay, God. But for now, it's a mystery, and that's okay. It's not a mystery to God. And we'll try to clear it up a little bit next week, but it's going to be a bit of conjecture. Now, we move from Satan's incarceration to the reign of the saints. That's in verses 4 through 6. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So at this point, Satan, the demons, and all the God-rejecting sinners have been taken care of, and they're out of the way. So now the millennial kingdom of peace and righteousness can begin. The supreme ruler, of course, will be Jesus Christ, but the saints will be reigning with him, obviously in a subordinate position, and our reign will entail carrying out his will in his kingdom on earth. Look at verse 4 again. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. So there's the thrones that we'll be reigning from, and they're not thrones of judgment in the sense that you know there's wrath there like the great white throne. Fortunately, we're not determining anybody's eternity. I don't want that responsibility. These thrones have judicial authority to enforce the will of Christ and arbitrate disputes between earthly inhabitants. The earth is inhabited with human beings, and they're going to have conflicts, and we'll be there to help. Paul alludes to this in 1 Corinthians 6 because there were problems there in the church. The Corinthian Christians were taking each other to court in front of unbelievers, and he says in verse 2, Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? And so Paul argues, if you're going to have authority to make decisions in worldwide disputes, can't you handle these small church problems you have? So we have the saints sitting on the thrones, reigning with Christ. And now John introduces another group of saints who will reign with Christ in his kingdom. Look at verse 4 again. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. These are the martyred believers that came out of the tribulation. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, or had taken the mark. Instead, they believed in Christ, they clung to the truth they found in his word, and they faithfully proclaimed it. They also paid the ultimate price for their faith, and they were beheaded. So these tribulation saints that were faithful to death, it says, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, came to life doesn't refer to a spiritual resurrection, spiritual life, the new birth. They were already alive spiritually at the moment of embracing Christ by faith. So this is a physical, bodily resurrection. The soul has been alive in heaven with God, and now the body joins up with it. Again, there is much mystery in that, but it's what happens. And it says they are going to reign with us. Now John adds a parenthetical footnote. Look at verse 5. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. These are the unbelieving dead of all ages. Their resurrection will be to judgment and damnation, and we'll see that next time in verses 11 through 15. This resurrection of the wicked happens at the end of the thousand years when they're called to the great white throne. That was parenthetical. Now Paul goes right back to the resurrection of the righteous. Verse 5, he just says, this is the first resurrection. Well, let me restructure verses 4 and 5 a bit to make it a little bit clearer. Starting in verse 4, 
Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So, John calls the resurrection of the saints from all ages. Now get this, this is important. John calls the resurrection of the saints from all ages the first resurrection. Now there are really only two classes of resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the wicked or the lost. But there are many phases of the first resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous. Christ was the first to be resurrected, then some saints near Jerusalem shortly after Jesus' resurrection, also the Christians at the rapture. There's the two witnesses during the Great Tribulation. You also have the tribulation martyrs at the beginning of the millennium, and then the Old Testament saints and the saints who die during the millennium. And so this first resurrection has many phases and covers a few thousand years, starting at the resurrection of Christ and carrying on into the millennium with the saints who die there. But it's all part of the first resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous. Next, John gives us three blessings of being in the first resurrection, and they're great. Look at verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So the first blessing for those who are resurrected in this first resurrection. The second death, or hell, has no power over them. Revelation 20, verse 14 says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So, no true child of God will ever face God's eternal wrath or hell. Romans 5, 9 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. The second blessing, they will be priests of God and of Christ. Peter says all believers are, 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So believers now serve as priests by worshiping God and leading others to the knowledge of him. And we will continue that service during the millennial kingdom. The third blessing the participants in the first resurrection will enjoy. We will reign with Christ, verse 6 again, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. The millennial kingdom is going to be an amazing time, isn't it? Scripture tells us the rule of Christ and the saints will be universal and righteous. This is the time when the remaining Jews are converted and restored to their land. It will also be a time when the Gentile nations worship the king. Isaiah tells us the nations will all come to Jerusalem to visit the king and to learn from him. It will be a wonderful time of righteousness, peace, joy, and physical health, leading to long life. It's just going to be fantastic. So let's conclude this then. Saints, this is our future, and it's incredible, isn't it? We are taken to be with Christ in the rapture. We're going to enjoy the wedding supper. Then we're going to return to earth to reign with our Lord. We will enjoy this incredible time of a thousand years where Satan is incarcerated and paradise on earth is restored. But I've got to ask, what about you? What does your future hold? This is the most important question anybody can ask, right? Are you ready for the future? Are you ready for heaven? The only way you can be prepared is to place your faith in Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way. Your own works won't get you there. Another religion can't get you there. Any of the thousands of godless philosophies, all these can't carry on beyond the grave. They won't get you into heaven. But here's the thing. You can take that way today. While you may still be unsure of many things, you can know for sure that you're safe from judgment. If you'll do this. If you'll believe what Jesus did was sufficient to save you, and believe that the Father will accept his work on your behalf. Then go to the Father, confess your sin, ask him to save you, and he will. You will become his child. Heaven will become your home. 
and the threat of hell will end for you. Well, all right, brothers and sisters, we're through. Thank you, all of you who have been sharing these videos out. More and more churches are using them in small groups, so I really thank you for that. It really helps the channel. Also, please continue to pray that God will use these videos to save many. All right, guys, God bless you. I love you guys, and I'll see you in the next video.